E-minis are incredibly efficient. You're competing against the pea shooters all the way up to the major players, which includes some savvy and not so savvy players. At least that's how it appears. So let's say some big fund needs a hedge. Sometimes they might just step on the market and without any with a complete disregard. It could also be a, a, a rounders. I don't know why I put rounders, rounders market, but rounders market. I think there was a movie called Rounders. I think it was Matt Damon. And they was talking about how poker, a lot of the poker players are called rounders because it's like the money just goes around and around and around the table and you never really get anywhere. Now, this is a, an older slide, but uh, some of the things for maybe an intraday strategy, strategy might just be buy when they're going up using stop entries and attempt to maybe hold the low of the day if you can. A lot of cases that would be kind of extreme, but if you're, if you're playing like an opening gap reversal, then maybe the low plus a little wiggle run might be a place to get in. And then you could sell them while they're going down, maybe use a stop entry and attempt to hold the high of the day. Now that's a very crude strategy. I wouldn't recommend you just rush out and do that tomorrow, but that's something you might wanna kind of wrap your head around especially if you have some kind of backing on a daily chart, or if it's a Russian doll type of setup, meaning that the daily charts are set up a certain way, or if you're trading something like an opening gap reverse or whatever. One thing I've noticed, and this is something that was confirmed by talking with Damon, is sometimes you have this race to the finish, either up or down, and that could be like an order imbalance that's happening. So if a fund is, is uh, let's say an ETF fund is long, and then it's also short, they also have a short fund, then they've got to balance out according to SEC and they might have to rush in and buy a couple of hundred contracts. Peter Brandt once said, don't lose 30 cents in a 10 cent market. And that kind of struck a chord with me, especially years ago when I chased my tail a lot, uh, trying this E-mini thing, right? And what he's saying is if the market's just kind of bumping along, up and down, up and down, up and down, don't go in there and, and make a bunch of trades and lose a bunch of money wait for it to go one way or the other. Now, one thing I, I do, and sometimes I get a little caught up in the markets and not pay attention, but one thing I try to do is you wanna wait for that range to begin to expand a little bit. And I, this is a, a think or swim formula, pretty simple formula. I'm looking at the, today's day, the high minus the low, and based on the 10 day, ATR. Now, as I'm looking at this, and this is the beauty of teaching, is that that's yesterday's ATR, average true range. Maybe I should change this formula to be the average intraday range because the high and the low would be your intraday range, right? Okay. Anyway, you divide those two out. And as a general statement, you want to stay out of the market if it's 50% or below if it's below 50% of its average range. As a general statement, if you're playing an opening gap reversal or something, you don't have the day's range, so you don't know, or some of the day's range. Um, another thing is, is, let's say the range is over 50% and you have a big rush down during the day and all of a sudden there's a vacuum and go straight back up. Sometimes you can play that fake out of the fake out, but this little formula will keep you out of a lot of trouble because if the market's just kind of chopping around like Peter Brandt said, it's a 10 cent market, you know, you don't want to go in and lose 30 cents. And you might want to give up after a couple of three stabs at the market. Now to understand efficiency, inefficient markets versus efficient markets, an inefficient market would be like an IPO, thinner stocks within reason, lower price stocks sometimes, like that CLOV, that looks like a pretty inefficient stock to me. ULS was an IPO recently. We recently played and got stopped out of that one. Uh, NNE went to the freaking moon and fortunately came right back in. That's an inefficient stock because those huge moves aren't priced in. Now, higher HV stocks, within reason, now you don't want to go too crazy, but higher HV with a little structure might be something that you might want to take a look at. Uh, shit coins can be hugely inefficient, we'll talk about those too. And, and keep in mind that as a market matures, it becomes more and more efficient. So Bitcoin, it's kind of going through that maturing process. Think about it. So now you've got derivatives, you've got ETFs, you've got options on the ETFs, you've got 
futures. You've got options on those futures. You've got ETFs on those futures. <clears throat> so it's getting quite um, it's getting quite crowded in the um, in the in Bitcoin now. An efficient market would be something like forex or sorry about that forex or e minis as mentioned earlier and uh really big cat stocks now i find it interesting when i go to gym and i've met a couple of guys there that are traders or are learning to trade i should say well one in particular young kid and he's now off at um he went off to college but he was trading e-minis and he was going through a prop firm so he was leveraged and trying to trade e-minis that's a that's a horrible way to 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 <laughs> to learn how to trade the other gentleman is trading and still trades forex and e-minis and as i remind him quite often those are the two probably most difficult markets that are in the world to trade and then big cap stocks can also be wildly inefficient um some of these big cap stocks might have, I uh, forget the actual exact numbers on specific stocks, but it's something ridiculous like hundreds, if not thousands of analysts looking at these stocks. So that could certainly cause a lot of, of noise and canceling each other out and so forth and so on and so forth. Now, with an inefficient market, your, your big moves aren't priced in. And that's the whole idea. And I'll show you a couple of inefficient moves here. And just one second and that that cues now again a uh, uh, efficient market can make an inefficient move like the cues it's just something that doesn't happen as often as it does in an inefficient market now these imbalances can happen quickly so the the nne it's a mobile nuclear stock and boy that was the rage there for about a week huh <laughs> so everybody just rushed in and the thing went up uh, something ridiculous Unfortunately, it's one of those bottle rocket moves that I often talk about. Now, keep in mind that it's a crowded playing field with many people fighting it out in an efficient market, okay? You've got people that are hedgers, and, and some of these people just come in and step on the market without even knowing they're doing it. Uh, others are a little bit more savvy, but they ended up kind of playing games. Fund managers, obviously, you could have an ETF in balance, which is something that I kind of alluded to a second ago. And you you have one lotters, okay? So you, a one lotter is not going to make that big of a difference, but if you have thousands and thousands of one lotters, it can. An inefficient market is a less crowded playing field. You have fewer players, obviously. Now they can offer the best opportunities, especially if you're taking e position trades as we do now again as i alluded to inefficient moves can occur but they can be infrequent and only during special circumstances so maybe you might have a big gap down in a strong uptrend and that creates a vacuum and the market goes straight back up in an efficient market Open a gap reversals, that, that's, I just described an open a gap reversal or ogres as we now call them. Now on the short side, I actually kind of like a more efficient market because an inefficient market, let's say I short some kind of biotech and tomorrow they announce I've got some cure for some horrid disease or whatever, that biotech might double overnight and I'm gonna be a hurting pup short in that, being short, right? Whereas if you have a, a big cap stock that has a lot, of players in it and it begins to roll over then there's a possibility that more and more of those players are going to rush to the door as that move begins to accelerate lower and you're short now shorting is a tough thing but we'll get into that uh, we could revisit that when we have to i guess when market begins to roll over again but shorting could be really really tough anyway so this is a um i dusted off my crypto account and i saw this one going up now, again, I recommend you don't buy stocks just going up. I like setups like the ledger light pullbacks and bow ties if it's market's making a transition rolling over. APH is one we played not too long ago on the short side, and it turned out to be a better than the poke in the eye trade. I did trade options on that, and it turned out pretty good, pretty well. Um, and you can go and watch the YouTube on that. It's a week of charts from probably a month ago, maybe a little longer. But anyway, I just want to show you a live trade here. So I bought this one a couple of days ago. 
and my IPT initial profit target is up here at 20%. Now here's one we talked about in the weekly charts about a month or two months ago, maybe a little longer. And I wanted to show this in the seminar I was part of because it's it's such a wildly inefficient move and money management was crucial. And the other reason I wanted to show it was that this was a new shitcoin and it was just going up. And so I bought it because it was going up. Now, again, unless you're like in a 1999, you don't want to rush out and bunch of, buy a bunch of stocks just because they're going up. But these shit coins can become all, all coins, as some people call them, the non-trader types, uh, can make some wildly inefficient moves. So you can see that was a 675% run and uh, took partial profits at 20% higher. I did scale out a tiny bit of this one. I did some um, mining. So I did some mining, so to speak, and took off uh, small amounts of this and put it into Bitcoin. And that's kind of like uh, something I've been doing for S and Gs over the years is kind of mining these altcoins as opposed to trying to run a minor uh, computer, which I don't think an individual person could make money doing that. Correct me if I'm wrong, or if you're doing it and you can make money doing it, let me know. But to me, it just seems like a, a horrible way to try to make money, at least in this day and age, unless you're like a, Amara or one of these big companies like Riot and a few others. But anyway, stopped out for 420% gain, better than the poke in the eye. And keep in mind with this altcoin stuff, I'm doing uh, nickels and dimes. I'm not, I'm not, this is not my core methodology. It's not my bread and butter, but it is a fun thing to do because trading is trading for the most part. And especially in these wildly inefficient markets. And one thing I pointed out again in last week at Bandcamp in the seminar, is that this thing did a round trip, so money management obviously is crucial. You're like, Dave, you sure to give up a lot in a trade. Yeah, but I already took some partial profits off, and I scaled out a little bit, like I just said, mining, so to speak, to Bitcoin. And then I stopped out after giving up a substantial part of the trend. But I didn't know whether that – I didn't know. You never know if the last correction is going to be uh, just a correction, right? So you have to give it lots of room once you're in that longer-term trend-following mode and see how long you can hang on. 